Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Alfonso de Villa, who's a SETI Institute PI, works across at NASA Ames. Alfonso did a BS in Marine Sciences and a MS in Marine Geology and Physics at the University of Vigo in Spain, uh, and then uh, did his PhD at the University of Munich in Geophysics. Then he came across to do a postdoc at NASA Ames. He's a postdoc fellow for three years from 2006 to 2009, and since then he's been a research scientist at the SETI Institute at NASA Ames. He's conducted a lot of field work in Antarctica, Atacama, uh, the Canadian High Arctic, uh, the uh, Negev Desert, Rio Tinto, and uh, uh, his interests are uh, many and varied regarding astrobiology. He has uh, published on the subsurface oxidation of, uh, of uh, minerals and, uh, on Mars. He's published on hydroscopic minerals and the potential for life on Mars. He's working on a project called the Dry Limit of Life on Earth, cyanobacteria and halite pinnacles in the Atacama Desert. He's also a co-investigator on the Ice Bite Automated Auger in Search for Life on Mars project. And he's also published uh, on magnetotactic bacteria. And uh, just recently, he's been looking into glaciation cycles on Mars. So I'm sure he's going to touch on a lot of those topics in his talk today. So please join me in welcoming Alfonso. OK, thanks, Adrian, very much. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, the topic of the talk today is about the possible nature of extraterrestrial life and where to look for it. Now, there is a lot of people who are involved in this work, and they are thoroughly not acknowledged in the talk. Uh, but uh, this is obviously not the result of on one, only one person working. Um, uh, the other, the other um, caveat about this talk is I'm talking about life that is essentially similar to Earth life. It's water-based and it's carbon-based. This talk is not about life that is very weird, very different from us, uh, like uh, in environments like the surface of Titan or silicon-based life. So. Everything that I'm going to say is uh, with respect to that type of chemistry. We can discuss of the chemistries at the end of the talk, but that's essentially what I'm talking about, this water-based life, carbon-based life. And so to get straight into um, business here, we've actually searched for life before. We've tried it once. That was the Viking missions on Mars in the 1970s. That the strategy behind the Viking missions was motivated because back then we were a lot more optimistic with respect to the possibility of finding life in other worlds, and we were far less knowledgeable about the nature of life, especially in very extreme environments. And so when Viking went to Mars, the idea was that we could stimulate life to produce a certain number of compounds or conduct a certain type of reactions that we could sense or detect with different instruments. We were looking for life's viral processes. There were a number of instruments on the Viking landers, and they failed to detect any evidence of life, although this is still debated by some. Uh, but the, uh, there has been plausible non-biological explanations for most of the Viking experiments, if not all of them. Now, we know now that the Viking approach was some, somewhat flawed. The Vikings were great. The, the, the mission was great technologically. The approach was somehow flawed because on the one hand, since the Viking, we've learned, for example, that the type, this type of approaches of detecting life, which is essentially culture-based methods, so we stimulate growth, and then we see the results of microbes growing. This is something that microbes, we're not really good at doing it, not even on Earth, where we understand life. So if we go to samples of extreme environments, so places we go to extreme environments on Earth, and we collect samples, and we try to uh, stimulate growth, we normally stimulate about 10% le or less of the microbes living in those soils. On Mars, which we understand far less, we probably were, n were not even capable of stimulating anything there, if there was something to start with. In addition to that, we now know that the chemistry of the Martian surface is such that it simulates bio biological processes through non-biological mechanisms. There is chemistry going on on Mars that is very similar to biological chemistry. And that was a big uh, interference during the measurements. Um, and there is also compounds that are not compatible with, with some of the instrumentation that was on Viking. So that's all that put together is probably a good explanation of why Vikings succeeded. There's always the chance that life, there is, there is no life on Mars. That's always a possibility. Uh, but um, uh, nonetheless, this type of approach is not completely invalid. It's not completely 
we, we cannot completely disregard it. There is places in the solar system we're going to mention, like Europa and the surface of, of Enceladus, where uh, there is a lot of water, uh, liquid water. There's conditions compatible with life from Earth. And these kind of approaches could uh, potentially be used. But we need to keep in mind the Mars experience uh, when we try to design this type of, or apply this type of approaches to uh, Mar uh, Europa or Enceladus. Now, there is the ongoing approach to search for life. It's mostly focused on Mars, although there is ideas about missions going to Europa and Enceladus. The actual missions to search for life, or in a way search for life, are going to Mars. And that's uh, the, Ma the Mars Science Laboratory, which is currently working on Mars. And the next plan, the next mission to Mars, Mars 2020, mission that's going to search for life. Here the approach is to search for ancient habitable environments on Mars, places that were habitable billions of years ago, and look for remnants of life which are very stable uh, isotopic signatures or chemical signatures or organic signatures. So we're looking for fossils. We're not looking for moving, wiggling microbes. We're not looking for microbial activity. We're, mo we're looking for fossils, microfossils, many different types and shapes. And there is a big investment from NASA and other space agencies trying to find this type of life. That's an interesting strategy. Um, it's a strategy that gives us a yes or no answer. Uh, as I'm going to argue, it's not a strategy that really tells us much about the nature of life, if we were to find any evidence of it. If we were to find a fossil evidence of life on Mars from 3.5 billion years ago, there'd still be very many open questions about what was the metabolism of those microbes, what was their genetic code, how did they reproduce, what kind of microbes they were. There is a lot of information that is missed as life becomes fossilized. So a third option, and this is the talk today, is that we focus the search for life on the search for biochemistry. This is not a new idea that's been proposed over and over again. It's always, this approach has always hit the same wall, and the wall is when you search for biochemistry that is not of Earth, what do you search for? Now you have to make a number of assumptions. People would argue that we search for DNA because every organism on Earth has DNA. People would argue that that's not a plausible mechanism because DNA is a product of evolution. And uh, this, this debate has been going on and on for decades now. So I'm going to try, the, the first part of this talk is to convey the idea that there is aspects of biochemistry which are common, should be common, if not universal, to Earth-like life. There is aspects of biochemistry that are intrinsic to Earth life. And so once we separate both, then we might have a clear path towards finding biochemistry in other planets. Now this is a strategy that I like because that allows us to search for life in different places in the solar system, at least the places we think are habitable or were habitable at some point, with the same mechanisms. We can do comparisons between places if we, we, could, we were to get positive and negative results. And also is, a, is, a, is an approach that gives us the, m the most amount of information about whatever life forms we could find. And that's ultimately, that's the goal of, that's the reason why we search for life. Scientifically, searching for life in itself is not a science goal. That's a discovery exercise. It's a really fundamental thing that we need to do. But the reason we search for life is because we want to understand fundamentally how life originates, how life evolves, and what's the nature of life. Finding a fossil is a great scientific achievement, but it doesn't tell tells us much about these fundamental questions, the origin of life. What we're looking for is a second genesis of life, life that is independent of life on Earth. And to establish whether life is a sec is belongs to a second genesis or not is very complicated. It's not trivial. Now, a second genesis of life is life that maps outside of the tree of life. The, the, uh, this image here at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide, this is the tree of life uh, uh, for life on Earth. Every organism on Earth plots somewhere within this tree of life. This is based on our genetic code. This is based on RNA and DNA analysis. We're looking for something that maps outside of it. Uh, one of the reasons why we want to find this type of life is because if we can establish that life originated twice independently within our solar system, there is very, a very high likelihood, there's a very good chance that life is very common and widespread in the universe. Because then we will rule out the, the idea that life is a very difficult experiment, something that can only happen once in uh, billions of, uh, of planets. So uh, this is our motivation, this is our goal. Now, when we look at the chemistry of life on Earth, biochemistry is complicated. I hated it when I was in grad school. Uh, it involves a number of reactions and metabolisms, but to a fundamental level, 
biochemistry is relatively simple. Life on Earth is based on a very limited number of basic, bu basic building materials. We have the fatty acids and similar lipids, which are part of our membranes. That's what we, s we use to self-enclose self ourselves and separate ourselves from the surrounding medium. We have sugars that we use for energy. We have amino acids that we use for proteins, build up proteins and, so and also structural uh, purposes. And we have nucleobases, which are part of our genetic code. And also we use in some coenzymes and some molecules that carry sev several functions in the cell. This is, if you put an elephant in a cell uh, and you, and you uh, uh, grain them down to the smallest possible particles, you will find the same composition. It's going to be this composition. That's what makes life, life on Earth. Uh, you, uh, these are the universal properties of life on Earth. Now the question is, are these fundamental building blocks of life on Earth intrinsic to Earth life or universal? And, or else are some of them intrinsic and others universal? So that's, that's what I'm going to address in the next few slides. So what we know now from prebiotic chemistry, and especially from the study of meteorites and the composition of organic rich meteorites, is that many of those basic building blocks of life are found in meteorites or are easily or are relatively sim easily produced in prebiotic uh, chemistry, chemical reactions. So this table here uh, the, uh, shows all the amino acids that have been, have been detected in meteorites. There's about 80 of them. The arrows point to amino acids that are part of our proteins. These are amino acids that are in our proteins. The uh, plot in the middle, this shows the nucleobases, the stuff that forms DNA that have been found in meteorites as well. Now the blue line here and the purple line here, these are two of the common bases in DNA and RNA. That's guanine and adenine. The others are not typically found in DNA. Some of them occur in some uh, occasions and mostly because of diseases. But bo the bottom line is that these two, which are fundamental for us, uh, are found in meteorites. The images on the right, these are, fat, uh, these are um, amphiphilic molecules. This means molecules that have uh, a side that is hydrophilic. It likes water. Another side of the, mo the molecule is hydrophobic. It doesn't like water. These are commonly found. They are also found in meteorites, and they form this type of vesicles when, the vesicles when you put them in water, which actually resemble cells. So these have been suggested as probably the precursor molecules to the, the, the first cells um, um, for life on Earth. So the bottom line is that meteorites and prebiotic chemistry to an extent provides a bunch of the building blocks uh, that are required to, at, at least were required to form Earth life. The relevant thing about, thing about this is that the distribution of building blocks, all these amino acids and nucleobases and lipids in meteorites is not random. It's, uh, it follows thermodynamic principles, which means that the most simple, most stable compounds are the most abundant. We don't see anything weird in meteorites. We don't see anything that shouldn't be there. If we found it, probably meant there was life in the meteorites. Unfortunately, all meteorites so far are full of abiotic organic compounds, and they are formed because uh, they, they form following thermodynamic processes. So, for example, on the plot in the left, this is the abundance of amino acids in meteorites as a function of carbon number or complexity. As you can see, the simpler the amino acid, the more abundant it is. On the right is a simulation of the same frequency distribution of amino acids in meteorites uh, explained using only thermodynamic equations. So somebody put together all, the, all these amino acids uh, wrote a code on how to form these amino acids only based on thermodynamic free energy principles and the distribution that they obtained was essentially the same. Now why is this important? When we look at the choices that life on earth made in selecting all these building blocks, there's something that is quite striking. So here you have all 20 proteinic amino acids, uh, images of all of them. Now, <coughs> as uh, I showed earlier, the simplest ones with the, with the lowest carbon number were the most abundant prebiotic, prebiotically. On top of that, amino acids, especially amino acids, but other organic molecules as well, they can, sh they can uh, appear in different structures. The same molecule can have different structures. That's wh what we call isomers. Uh, you can have the same chemical formula, but they have a different shape and therefore di different properties as well. So uh, the simpler the amino acid, the less structural isomers you can have. There is the simplest the molecule, the less options you have. 
So for example, an amino acid with two carbons, there's only one type of it, glycine. That happens to be in our chemistry. But when the amino acid has five, six or more carbons in the structure, the, the number of possible structural isomers increases exponentially. The number of choices increases. Now, why is, why is this important? Because at the time of the origin of life on Earth, as I said, the most abundant building blocks were the simplest ones, means that the, the number of choices we had was limited. The chemical space, if you will, to form life at the, origin of, at, the, at the time of the origin of life is limited by the nature of the uh, organic compounds that are formed prebiotically or come with meteorites. So life at the origin has limited choices. Now, as life evolves, it brings, it, new, it brings in new, more complex compounds, like, for example, the very big amino acids, which are very difficult to synthesize. We need proteins and we need chemical path biochemical pathways to produce them. They're, done, they're, they're not found in meteorites. They're not easy to form prebiotically. Those life brings afterwards through the process of evolution and natural selection, because those amino acids, maybe they fulfill a metabolic purpose or a functional purpose, or it's an advantage to the, to the organism. So as time goes by, this chemical space that it's reduced for life amplifies, it explodes, and then life has to face a number of choices. And those, number, and those choices are made based on evolution. What's more advantageous for me? So in, a, in, in essence, what that means is that, or at least what we postulate, is that biochemistry is in a fundamental way a combination of chance and necessity. There's, there are aspects of biochemistry which are endowments that are inherited from the prebiotic world. These are the simple compounds. They're very abundant, very stable. And there is aspects of biochemistry that are the product of evolution. That happens because life, once it originates on a planet, it has to face a number of environmental constraints and limitations and challenges. And so evolution, through evolution, uh, it incorporates more complex molecules, it evolves. What this means is that in planets that are like Earth, water-based, with carbon-based chemistry, with a similar type of mineralogy, geochemical processes going on, if life originated on those planets at the beginning, it would have the same chemical, limited chemical space. And the selection of the basic building blocks to form life would have been very similar, if not the same. Now then, this planet, which arguably would be different geochemically from us, uh, would present different challenges to life, and evolution would take life in a different course. The incorporation of more complex monomers would be different but there will be always a subset of that biochemistry that will be like us. That's our basic um, assumption here. Now, what are these universal and versus local biochemical motives? There is still a lot to be investigated here, so I just provide a few examples. If we look at life on Earth, parts of our membranes contain molecules, the amphiphiles, which are very similar to those molecules that I mentioned in the meteorites that could form vesicles because we had, they had a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic sites. We have those in our cell membranes. We anticipate that life in other planets would have, if not the same molecules, very similar molecules. They would also need to be self-enclosed, forming cells, and the best solution would be the most, the, the more simpler solution would be these molecules. The simplest amino acids, like the ones you have here, which are very abundant in meteorites, should be amino acids that are common to life. The simple bases in DNA and RNA should also be common, except for example, in the case of one base, thymine, what we call T, which is present in DNA, that's as an example, that's a clear case of evolution. Thymine was incorporated into DNA probably because it's more stable against UV radiation. And it's, more, it's better at stabilizing the DNA molecule. It was probably not one of the original bases in, in, in DNA, probably because DNA was not the original nucleic acid. It was probably RNA, and thymine is not in RNA. So that's an, one example of something that we have on Earth that we don't need to expect, it could happen elsewhere, but we, don't need, we cannot expect it elsewhere. elsewhere. We have other um, compounds which are universally distributed in Earth life, like the phospholipids, but if you can see a phospholipid, it's a rather complicated molecule, and it's complicated because it fulfills specific purposes under the conditions of Earth. The same applies to the very large amino acids and, for example, the nucleotides. These are complex molecules that can be produced only through evolution when you have a machinery that allows you to produce them. It's not something that nature gives for free. These ones we get for free, the ones above. So we can establish uh, um, lists, we can establish groups 
of biochemical motives that we would expect to see here and somewhere and elsewhere in the second genesis. We can establish biochemical motives that would allow us to distinguish the second genesis from us. Uh, this is an example of an, a, 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 a practical example of how we could use it. What you can see here is the concentration of this, these simple amino acids found in meteorites and also in samples, in different samples from Earth. So this would represent our abiotic sample and those would represent our samples containing life. And as you can see, although we're looking at the same amino acids, the frequency distribution of each one of them is different. In meteorites, we have the simple ones being more abundant than the complex ones, within, even within this simple group of amino acids. Whereas organisms accumulate different types of amino acids, not depending on their simplicity, but depending on their functionality. And so the result is, what we see in these samples is that amino acids that are not very abundant in meteorites happen to be very abundant in, in samples that contain life. So that's one way we, we could distinguish even compounds that are abundant in life and in non-life, we could distinguish the origin of both of them. Now, if we agree that there is some biochemical motives that can be searched for in other planets uh, and which are common to our biochemistry, then the question is where to search for them. And that's a tricky question and that's uh, an important one. So there is, uh, with respect to Earth-like planets, there is three places in the solar system where we could be searching for life because they have liquid water at some point, either in the present or in the past. The, the, the first one is Mars, and this is an obvious one, and I'm going to focus on that for the rest of the talk. The other two are Europa and Enceladus. These are no-brainers. We have liquid water. If we were to search for life, it wouldn't make sense to search for, search for fossils or, uh, uh, or, isotope or, uh, chemical isoto or chemical signatures of life in Europa and Enceladus. The most logical choice would be search for organic compounds and biochemistry. Now, the case of Mars is completely different. Mars is different because we, the only evidence for liquid water on Mars comes from three and a half to four billion years ago. Since then, the planet has been bone dry, uh, maybe except for some episodic events with liquid water. But the possibility of life on Mars was obvious early on. It's far less obvious today. And that's partially what's motivating the, the way we're searching for life on Mars these days by looking for uh, fossils in ancient environments. Now, the history, of, uh, the, the history of Mars, we have a very good idea of it. I'm not going to go into details, but essentially what I was saying is that early on in the history of the planet, at the time when the planet was short after the planet finished building itself, uh, the conditions on the surface were warmer and wetter than today. We don't know how much warmer and we don't know how much wetter, but certainly better than today, at least enough to sustain liquid water on the surface. Now, we also know that there was a magnetic field, which is a great thing to have if you're a living organism. Uh, we also know that that magnetic field switched off very early and that's a very important constraint for life and st something probably we still don't understand the implications of it. But not short after, we also lost the liquid water. And since then, Mars is becoming this progressively drier and colder planet. So that's the scenario we have to search for life, especially to search for biochemistry. We have to search for biochemistry in a planet, if you follow our, uh, our uh, arguments, we have to search for biochemistry in a planet that became increasingly dry, increasingly cold. So what do we do to get around this issue? We go to places on Earth where somehow, which somehow are similar to Mars at some point in the evolution of the planet, especially when it was drier and colder. Now, the problem with, that it, the problem with this approach is that biochemistry, biochemical compounds have an expiration date. They don't really last too long. It's not like an isotopic signature that can last for billions of years. It's not like a footprint on a mudstone that can be preserved for a long period of time. Biochemistry has an expiration date. That's been another reason why biochemistry is not a very uh, sought for strategy to search for life. For example, if we have a DNA molecule of a relatively decent size and we leave it in the environment sitting there, even in the absence of other organisms chewing on it and eating it, that molecule is going to degrade with time and decompose just because of the thermodynamics of the molecule. It's, it's too complex of a structure to, con to, to to, pres to be preserved for a long time. It's going to decay into the smaller, its smaller constituents. And so uh, we can model that, and it turns out that a DNA molecule sitting in the uh, environment uh, wouldn't last more than, in at, at, uh, at room temperature, wouldn't last more than a few thousand years. Now, <clears throat> the great thing about chemistry is that it slows down with temperature, and that's great on Mars because Mars is cold. And we can predict how much chemistry slows down 
as a function of temperature, and that's the, gra the plot that you see here. So this would be what we get. That would be the same decay rate of a DNA molecule at room temperature, and that's the decay rate of the same molecule when we decrease the temperature by uh, a number of degrees. When we get to temperatures where are, which are similar to temperatures on the surface of Mars today, like at 228, 248 degrees, then the lifetime of these molecules becomes hundreds of millions and even billions of years. So that's great for us. Biochemistry is not, has an expiration date, but in some, in, in, on Mars, for example, Mars, the temperature, the cold temperatures are playing to our advantage. Also the dryness, although that's not so well understood as the temperature, but dryness is also very good at preserving uh, organic compounds and different types of minerals as well. So there can be, we, we can make a case that we could search for biochemistry even in very old sediments on Mars. But then you're really playing with fire here. You're really uh, assuming a number of things that maybe you shouldn't be assuming when you have $2.6 billion uh, in uh, instrumental payloads. So what we, th what we think is a better strategy is to, looking at that evolution of Mars, uh, try to understand what would be the last possible places for life could have been active on Mars, the last footholds of life, the last places of habitability along this history. And then those should be the places which, where, where we have the freshest biochemistry. Like, uh, maybe dead, but still preserved. Hopefully that happened not too long ago, not 3.5 billion years ago, but maybe uh, half a billion years ago. And in that case, temperatures will be a lot more on our side in preservation. So how, we, how do we learn about where life goes as conditions become increasingly cold and increasingly dry, we go to deserts on Earth. We go to most, the most extreme deserts on Earth, like the Antarctic Dry Valleys and the Atacama Desert. Um, we try to understand what happens to life in those environments. We, happen, we try to understand as we move from conditions which are warmer and wetter to conditions which are colder and drier, how life responds to it. And the idea is that life on Mars would, would follow the same strategies. Now, there is a caveat to that. If we were to find that life in these environments adapts to them using biochemical means, then we're in trouble because we couldn't extrapolate that necessarily to Mars because that would be an invention of terrestrial life. But as it happens to be the case, if life decides, if life adapts to those conditions, not using biochemical means, but using the environment as a protective uh, system, then there is something we can extrapolate to Mars because conditions, the environment will be the same. Is that clear? And so we go, or I go, uh, essentially to do to these two places. I'm quite fortunate to call this my office space, basically because I spend most of my time in there, not in my office. But uh, I'm going to talk today about the Atacama, the specific case of the Atacama. I'm not going to talk about the dry valleys. That's a different story. In both, despite their extreme extreme deserts, uh, th those uh, two environments have important differences between them. But uh, there is some commonalities, especially when it comes to adaptation to conditions. So the Atacama is the driest place on Earth, drier than the dry valleys. Uh, that's the, the desert in northern Chile. Within the desert, there is different zones. It's not the whole desert is, as, as, is equally dry. There is a part in the desert which is called the uh, hyperarid core, where conditions are extremely dry. Precipitation rates are less than one millimeter per year. Doesn't mean that it rains every year. It means that it rains a bit every 10 years. And then when you average it out, you come with one millimeter a year. If you've been to the Mojave Desert, for example, mean annual precipitation in the Mojave is about 100 millimeters a year. So the Atacama is about 100 times drier than that. It's a phenomenally dry place. Uh, you can see it here in these satellite pictures. The, the reasons why the Atacama is so dry, it's a number of reasons. One of them is because there is an ocean current the Humboldt current right in front of Chile, which is cold, it's cold water. Cold water doesn't really pump water vapor in the atmosphere, so that already gives you a, a dry, there's a similar things happen in Namibia and these type of coastal deserts. The other reason is because tectonically, the Atacama is in an active zone. So you have the Pacific plate here uh, going under the continental plate, and that creates uplifting of mountains. First, you had a mountain range uplifting near the coast, a long, long time ago, and then you have the uplifting of the Andes. And where these are are natural barriers against moisture. They, they block moisture coming from both the east and the west, and as a result, you have the central depression in the middle, which is extremely, extremely dry. That's, uh, that's in a nutshell the reasons why the Argam is so dry. Now, <clears throat> to give you some, some numbers, 
Uh, it's quite a long desert. It's very long. It's very narrow. It's about 1,200 kilometers long, about 300, 400 kilometers wide. It's really old. The Atacama is supposed to have been a desert for 100 million years and an extremely dry desert for at least 15 million years. Uh, there has been obviously back and forth fluctuations, climate fluctuations, but the essence is uh, it's been very dry for a long, long time. It's the driest place on Earth. The temperatures are not too extreme. This is the mean annual temperature. And one of the better indications of how dry it has been for so long is the presence of massive nitrate deposits. Now there is not, nit not enough, not, 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 no longer nitrate there anymore. Most of it is in the US and Europe. We've used it for fertilizers. But uh, you used to have the largest nitrate accumulations on the planet. So uh, now the interesting thing about the Atacama, as I, uh, uh, as I said earlier, is that it's not equally dry everywhere. It's particularly when you move from south to north, from Santiago, Chile, for example, to into the dry air, uh, the really dry desert, you go through this humidity gradient, this transition where you have to the south, you have elevated mean annual rainfall, and then at some point you cross this threshold where mean annual precipitation really goes almost to zero. And what this is, is not just an, envir it's not a, uh, an environmental gradient in humidity, that also gives us an opportunity to, to look at what happens to life as conditions become increasingly dry. You know, in a way, it's like going through the history of water uh, and rainfall on Mars uh, in the same place. We're going from a place that was wet at some point to a place that it's dry at the other point. And we can see what happens to life along this gradient and what happens to other things like the chemistry of the soils and so on and so forth. So one of the things that happens that was published a few years ago is that the amount of organic compounds in the soils and the number of cells in the soils decreases dramatically. We go from areas where we have normal cell concentrations in the ground, maybe uh, hundreds of millions to billions of cells per gram, to places where we have about a thousand cells per gram, the, about the lowest biomass we can possibly see anywhere else on Earth. Um, we go to uh, th th these, uh, these very dry areas are also areas that where the soil has a chemistry that is very similar to the Viking chemistry, in fact. When you try to run the Viking experiments in the Atacama, you get very similar results to the Viking experiments on Mars. Uh, and this is because of the dryness and the chemistry of the soil. So in, in many different ways, it's a great analog for Mars. A few more numbers uh, about cell concentrations. When you go to relatively wet areas, you get about millions of cells per gram. When you get to the very dry areas, get about thousands of cells per gram. Many of those cells, we now think we know, many of those cells are not actually cells that are adapted to that area. They're not the strongest possible cells on Earth. They're just the likely few that didn't die in the process of being carried to this place. Mostly they're survivors. They're spore-forming microbes. They don't live in the conditions of the Atacama. They wait for the occasional rain to activate, or they just die because the rain doesn't come. And that's a very important um, thing to keep in mind on Earth. And also when we're searching for life on Mars, on Mars a place could be non-habitable, but it doesn't need to be sterile. That's what we see in the Atacama. It's not habitable, but it's non-sterile because there's life everywhere and life gets carried. This table is not sterile. There's life here. It's not habitable either. It's, just, it's, it's very hard to preserve life from moving around. That's very important when we're searching for life on Mars as well. One of the most dramatic Examples of what happens when an environment becomes very, very dry, like the Atacama, is this example here. What you see here is an image of a quartz rock, and that's the underside of the quartz. And what you see green, these are cyanobacteria, microorganisms, photosynthetic microorganisms. Now, this is the most common survival strategy of life in deserts. You go to any desert in the world, and you find a quartz about this size, I'll bet you a round of beers that it's going to have green stuff underneath. That's very, uh, that's uh, widespread strategy. The reason is because the underside of the quartz, one, keeps moisture when it rains and when there is dew or fog, it, it attracts the moisture and it keeps it in there so the microbes have access to more moisture for longer. The other one is that it, the quartz itself is transparent, it lets light get through and so microbes can be photosynthetic even being under, on the underside of the rock. Very common, very clever strategy. Now in the Atacama, when we follow the rainfall gradient and we go from places that are relatively wet to places that are extremely dry, this strategy seems to fail at some point. There is at some point in the Atacama where hypolites, we call these hypolites, meaning under the rock, there is a point in the Atacama where hypolites can no longer take it. They disappear. We have quartz, 
it's not colonized. That's the only place on Earth where we see that, maybe with the exception of the dry valleys in Antarctica. Now, all these combined made people to suggest that the Atacama was the dry limit for life, that it was the driest place on Earth and life. There was a, at some point in the Atacama, there was a barrier. There is a wall that life cannot cross. Life is not possible there. The past few years, we've, changing, we've been changing this notion. We've been, we started to recognize not that the Atacama is uh, lifeless, but the life is very picky. It's very, it chooses very carefully where it goes. It's not, it's not like micros choose. They don't have a choice. But in a, in a sense, they're very, uh, there's only a limited number of places where life can actually survive. And those are normally the inside of rocks, not the underside, not the top, not the soils, the interior of rocks. We call that endolithic life, inside of rocks. And that's a strategy that we also see in the dry valleys. That seems to be, in my opinion, the last possible strategy for life, inside rocks. Not inside every rock. They're very carefully at choosing what they, uh, which, uh, which rocks they use. So here are some examples of calcite, carbonate-rich rocks, uh, ichnimbrite, which are volcanic rocks, gypsum, which is a, it's a salt rock. Now, in the Atacama, we see many of those habitats, many of these rocks being colonized in areas around the dry core, the really dry area, the really dry part of the Atacama. Within the central depression, which is the hyperarid core of the Atacama, we don't see much of that. We only see one strategy that seems to be fun functioning and successful of uh, uh, survival in the dry core of the Atacama. And these are massive evaporites, massive salt deposits. This, what you see here on the right, this is a map of the Atacama, again. And what you see in black, these are massive continental evaporites, which are called salars, which essentially are the leftovers of lakes that were present in the desert b millions of years ago. Now, it's remarkable that a place on Earth has been able to keep all that salt in place for millions of years. And that gives you an idea already of how dry the Atacama is. And this is an, uh, an image of one of these salars. It's called Salar Grande, which is means, means large salar uh, in, northern, in the northern Atacama. This is about the size of the Bay Area, for you to have an idea. And this used to be a lake, which is what we have after we evaporate the waters, which is a lot of salt. Now, when you sit on top of this salar, that's what you see. It's massive and massive extensions of, of salt, which is essentially sodium chloride. It's your table salt, lots of it. Many meters down, 50 meters down, uh, lots of square kilometers across. And that's just one example of the many in the Atacama. Now, when you get closer to the surface, then you start seeing really weird things. These are what we call halide or salt nodules. That's covering the entire surface of the salt. This is not really weird, not anymore at least, we understand it. It was weird five years ago, but now we understand it. Uh, this is just the expression of what happens when a salt polygon grows in extreme and very prolonged dryness. If you've been to the dry, uh, to Death Valley, for example, Badwater Basin, you've seen the very nice white salt polygons there. That's what happens if you take the Death Valley and you, li you, leave, it, you, you, you leave it dry for 10 years these salt polygons are going to evolve slowly, very slowly, very gently, going to evolve into these type of nodules. It's a very interesting process. But the really interesting part of it is that when you get one of those nodules and you crack it open, that's what you see. You see green inside, lots of colonization. That's the same place where other rocks are not colonized or the soils have a bunch of dead bodies, so to speak. The inside of the salt is colonized with green microorganisms. Now, we've done a lot of characterization, we've done a number of studies to understand, one, what microbes are those, two, why are these microbes living in salt? If you think about it, we actually use salt to keep microbes away from our meat and from our fish. It turns out that these microbes decided to actually move inside salt so that they could escape from the conditions in the Atacama. They live inside the salt within the pore space between salt grains. And these are cells here, cyanobacterial cells, colonies that are clumped together inside the pore spaces. We have quite a number of different microbes in the soil. We have one type of photosynthetic microbe, cyanob uh, one type of cyanobacteria. There is other types of archaea and uh, heterotrophic bacteria, bacteria that grow using different substrates and stuff. And we're just le uh, learning that there is other photosynthetic metabolisms going on, not photosynthetic, sorry, carbon fixation metabolisms, primary productivity, which are going on. That's results that are uh, literally a couple of weeks old. So it's very exciting that the salt is not only able to sustain life, but quite, di quite a diversity of life and very, and very active. Now, the question after we found this was what's, why? 
why, what's the driving force for these microbes living in the salt? So we went back to the Atacama and we, we plugged a bunch of sensors in this salt and we tried to understand the chemical and physical conditions inside the salt for a long period of time, for one year. One of the things that we saw is that when you have, well, you have relative humidity conditions, and here is represented as the dotted line here, the relative humidity in the atmosphere in the Atacama is always very low. It's like, on average, in one year is about 36%, which is extremely dry. You could dry your laundry in, in seconds if you wanted. Uh, and it never goes above really 75 to 80%. It's only occasionally every decade or so that you have fog or rainfalls in the driest parts of the Atacama. But the conditions inside the salt were different. This is the black line here. What we observed is that the relative humidity inside the salt, at some moments in the year, it reached a certain value and it stayed constant at that value for weeks at a time. That was quite striking. Now, when we thought long and hard about it, we understood what it was. That's a property which is common to many salts, and especially chloride salts, which is called deliquescence. What deliquescence is, is a phase change. It's not very dissimilar to ice melting with temperature. This is salt melting with humidity. It's the same chemical, it's, the same similar pro it's a very similar process. So you start off with a grain of salt, and you increase the relative humidity slowly. At some point around 75%, you start to see that some parts of the salt become uh, liquid water, a brine. And eventually, the whole grain of salt just boop, melts into a saturated brine. A drop. That's very common. In, uh, it's a common phenomenon in atmospheric sciences because it creates uh, 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 droplets in the atmosphere and rain and so on and so forth. So the hypothesis there was that while we never have precipitation in the Atacama and these areas, and we have rainfall or fog, we often cross this threshold in humidity, and the salt is capable of turn the sun turns into water, and the microbes use the water for survival. So we tested this hypothesis using some instrumentation, I'm not going to go into details, essentially it's an instrument that tells you, on a sample, it tells you the distribution of chlorophyll, which is what the cyanobacteria use for photosynthesis, and it tells you when the, photo, the chlorophyll is active, or, or whether it's not active. So we set up this experiment where we, we took some salt samples and we put them in a closed system at low relative humidity, imaging the chlorophyll constant, constantly, and then increasing the relative humidity slowly, and that's what we saw. At the beginning, when conditions were, were uh, dry, the chlorophyll was present, but the yield, which is what we use to measure the activity of the photosystem, of the, photo of the chlorophyll, was zero. But at some point, uh, close to 70 to 75%, the deliquescence point of halide, the chlorophyll started to become inactive. And that's because the salt went through this transition and the microbes have ac had access to liquid water. So that's the first example that we know of, of uh, a, uh, a microbial system that is sustained only by water vapor. And that's very relevant not only for our understanding of the limits of, drive, uh, of life on Earth, but also for the possibility of life on Mars. Now, it turns out that there is very similar salt deposits on Mars to those in the Atacama Desert. All the black dots you see here are deposits that are, have been investigated using satellites on Mars. And we don't really know what they're made of. We know that they have, in their composition, they have chlorine, that's Cl, that's one of the elements. That's half of halide, half, half of the sodium chloride that we see in the Atacama. These compounds have that same element. We don't have any means to, want to, to actually measure what's the actual composition of the salts. But we have other indications that suggest that those deposits, that's what you see here, for example, in the middle picture, that's one of those deposits on Mars, which is, looks white. Uh, you can see them in different filters and different wavelengths, and then they show up in different colors. Uh, and then we have high resolution images of them. But we know that they are composed of something that contains chlorine in there. It could be many things. We also know that wherever they happen, they happen in, um, uh, in, in areas, for example, which are topographic lows, basins, depressions. That the, that's the place where salts precipitate, because that's the last place where you have liquid water. We also know that they have a surface morphology, like you can see in this picture here and the next picture, it's shaped in the form of polygons. That's something that we also see in evaporating deposits like bad water and in the Atacama. And we know that these deposits happen normally linked uh, uh, to other minerals like phyllosilicates. So here you can see more examples of uh, polygons. And then you can see here uh, one example of a salt deposit. And in green, you see phyllosilicates. Some of the phyllosilicates are linked to small craters, which, sorry, which excavated 
the, uh, the deposits, it excavated whatever was underneath the salt and exposed it on the surface. So this sequence of minerals where we have salts on top and clays below, that's a common sequence in evaporitic environments where the clays are precipitated first and the salts are precipitated later. So when you put all this information together, what you have is a very good case for uh, very ancient uh, salt deposits on Mars. We've dated them using date crater counts and things like these. They're about 3.6 billion years old which are compositionally could be similar to the ones in the Atacama. They could be other types of salts, like if it could be a calcium chloride or a magnesium chloride or even a perchlorate, which would be a phenomenal thing. Uh, but all of them have the same basic properties as chloride, the liquescence, with the caveat that, for example, calcium chloride and magnesium chloride, these deliquescence transitions doesn't happen at 75%, it happens at 30%. In the case of perchlorate, it happens at 10%. So only with 10% of humidity in the atmosphere, perchlorate forms a solution. Now, the next advantage of it is that salts, as you probably know, are very good antifreeze. Salts, when they form a saturated brine, they don't, the brine doesn't freeze again until the temperature goes well below zero. In the case of sodium chloride, minus 20. In the case of magnesium chloride, it's minus 30. In the case of calcium chloride, it's minus 50. And in the case of sodium uh, perchlorate, it can be as low as minus 70. So here we have a system that could be liquid for a long period of time, even under current, not probably current conditions, or we don't know if whether current conditions, but at least under conditions that probably were very recent on Mars, not 3.5 billion years ago, maybe hundreds of millions of years ago. So based on our arguments, we would argue that this would be the right place to look for biochemistry, because this place could have been habitable relatively recently, and whatever was there living could still be preserved in the soil. So this is in a nutshell, and this is a summary of the talk where essentially I'm summarizing all the points. Uh, so I'm not going to go through them. I'll just leave them for you to read. And then I guess we can take questions for the next 10 minutes. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll just start with the questions. Alf Alfonso, there's, yeah. um, there's been uh, high rises been finding some RSL uh, tracks that are uh, yes. uh, seasonally um, stoked uh, dark features that appear in springtime. Um, how do they play into the story um, with uh, potential Salt. for uh, salts and, and stuff like that at those sites? So that's, that's a big puzzle. Um, I've seen these things happening in the dry valleys where you have wet, despite you have very cold conditions, you have wet water tracks which are always in the same place. We haven't seen the seasonal recurrence that you see on Mars. Normally, they, they seem to always be there. Uh, people have proposed that the, these tracks on Mars are related to these kind of processes, the liquidance of salt. So these all other processes have been proposed, some of them involving not liquid water. Now, I have a problem with the, the liquidance story here. It's because when you have, you really need a, quite a bit of salt to have something that you can see from orbit. That's, that requires a lot of water and a lot of salt to bring it in. And the problem with that is that when you have salt that becomes wet and dry, the salt doesn't go away. The salt stays. And salt has a very distinct, as we can see, it has a very distinct feature. You should see changes in albedo which are consistent with salt being left behind when the water evaporates. But my understanding is that these water trucks, they come and go and they there's no body left behind. Uh, there's no indication of what caused it. Now, that's one problem. The other one is the mechanisms of it. So, okay, I can, I can understand that the in these places, we have a lot of salt in, and in the regolith. Then you need a source of water. I don't think the atmosphere has enough water to create such enormous features. I mean, the atmosphere of Mars is really, really dry. The Atacama is a jungle compared, compared to the atmosphere of Mars. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on, atmospheric, on Mars atmosphere, but my understanding is that if you compress the top kilometer of the Martian atmosphere in a, in a cubic meter, you get about 100 microns of water. That's a very tiny amount of water. And so uh, to have these, so a process that is being able, is able to pull so much water from the atmosphere that you can see it from orbit and then it leaves nothing behind, that to me is a phenomenal puzzle. So uh, I don't know, I don't know. Yep. Oh. Is there any evidence for a second genesis on Earth and would you expect or not expect to see one? So evidence there is none. Uh, there is suggestions that could have been. Certainly towards the origin of life, it would have been likely that the origin of life, well, 
for the optimistic type like me, it would have been likely that the origin of life happened several times in the different conditions. Uh, I'm, I'd be surprised if at this point we find it, uh, because we really excel at detecting life at very small amounts and we look far and wide for life. Now, certainly, if we search for life, DNA-based life. So our we have, right there we're biased. We might be missing things. But uh, I'd be truly surprised if there's a shadow biosphere that we haven't detected. Um, and actually, I don't know how we would be able to detect it. So that's another puzzle of the problem. Right? I've got a question. Actually, I have two questions, two questions here. Uh, the first, are there any organisms that can live in a perchlorate, uh, aqueous perchlorate? No. No. Not that we found. So uh, the uh, one problem of living in salt is what's called water activity. Uh, water activity, uh, there is a very sharp limit to water activity on, uh, for life on Earth. There is, uh, water activity is an idea of water availability. You can have a glass of water, and depending on what's with the water, you might be able to use the whole water or just a part of it. So for example, if you have a lot of salt, not all the molecules are available to you, and that reduces the water activity. Water activity of one means that fresh water. Salt, like sodium chloride, has a water activity of 0.75. Uh, nothing grows on Earth, as far as we know, below 0.69. Now, perchlorate, a saturated perchlorate brine, will have a water activity which is below that. It's also oxidizing. That's, that's a well, uh, perchlorate is oxidizing at tight temperatures. At no, our room temperature is a stable molecule. And in fact, perchlorate is food. There's microbes that feed on perchlorate. Perchlorate is an electron acceptor for many microbes on Earth. It's perchlorate based okay. metabolism. Uh, so inherently, it's not toxic. It's only toxic if it's very concentrated. Now, we don't really understand enough about salt, life in salt, especially at cold temperatures. One interesting phenomenon about that is that the water activity of saturated brines like perchlorate or magnesium chloride, which is also has a very low water activity, is that the water activity increases with temperature, um, with decreasing temperature. So for example, the magnesium chloride brine at room temperature has a water activity which is close to 30 something percent. But when the temperature is minus 30, that water activity is close to 0.6. It goes up for a number of reasons. So uh, we don't understand enough about the habitability. It's certainly a nasty place to live. Qu quickly, uh, sorry, the second question, yeah. dealing with the first half of your talk, which was based upon the presumption of an exogenous supply of organic materials. Now, there is a school of thought that, in fact, it was endogenous. Yeah. Any comments? Yeah, so, um, so it's true. Uh, a lot of the discussion was based on meteorites. But uh, whatever chemistry was endogenous to Earth that could produce this type of compounds is chemistry that is also governed by thermo thermodynamics. Uh, uh, my expectation is that prebiotic chemistry endogenous to Earth would also preferentially form the simplest <coughs> Uh, more stable compounds. It shouldn't form more complex, for example, aromatic amino acids. It's that, that type of prebiotic chemistry. Now, if there is pathways, chemical pathways, prebiotic, that can lead to that kind of complexity, then it's true. But, uh, but, but uh, yeah, you're right. Most of my discussion was based on what we see in meteorites. Uh, it's not so much what can be produced prebiotically, yeah. endogenously on Earth. My question is, uh, is not Mars uh, too close to look for second genesis of life there? Because yes. uh, if you find life there, maybe it will be a first genesis. Exactly. Right? Good point. And that's how, how would you distinguish between the yeah. two? So, um, so yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, Mars is very close. It could have been, there could have been transport back and forth. Um, so how do you distinguish the second genesis? So there's two aspects to this point. One of them is that because of that, finding fossils is not going to be enough because it's so close. If we find a fossil on Mars and we can't tell where the fossil, what the properties or what the composition of that microbe was, we can't tell whether it was a first genesis or second genesis. If we find a stromatolite on Mars, we don't know if it's related to us or not. Stromatolite itself is not going to tell us that. That's another reason why we have to focus on biochemistry. Because biochemistry gives us enough room to be able to distinguish between one, say, one genesis and the other. And for example, one thing we can do, I'm sorry, I'm just moving through slide here, is we could look for this bunch of simple prebiotic amino acids, and then we could see whether they are D amino acids or L amino acids. 
we have a sample on Mars that has the same number of amino acids, but they are all D amino acids, that would be suggestive of life and a second genesis, because life on Earth only uses L amino acids. That would be one way. Um, we could search for the same type of things in sugars. We could search for L sugars instead of D sugars, uh, and that would be another indication. Uh, we could search for more complex biomolecules, which probably you wouldn't know how to search for them. Uh, alternative nucleic acid structures, like for example protein nucleic acids, PTNs, or other structures of nucleic acids. Things like these would be indicative of a second genesis. So I don't think there is one instrument, one tricorder that you can go and say, boom, there is a second genesis. Uh, you probably need a bunch of uh, different approaches, but probably only biochemistry is going to be able to solve that question on Mars. Hi, um, this may be a silly question. I'm, I'm a visual artist, not a professional scientist. I know enough to follow what you were saying. <laughs> That's though. good, I'm glad. Okay. But um, one of your slides, you were showing the possible history of, of Mars from arid to dry. Yeah, that one. Um, it lists land, hydrothermal, marine, and lacustrine. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Oh, sorry. So what this means are possible environmental uh, environments to support life. So land environments, that would be like deserts where the type of, uh, like what I was talking about, where life would be uh, inhabiting rocks or things like this. Hydrothermal, uh, hot springs. Uh, marine, uh, same idea, sediments and so on, and lakes, like Gale Crater where MSL is. And so, and those lines, what they represent is, and that's a, that's a figure that you have to take with a grain of salt. I mean, it's not, so. Okay, okay. L lakes, lakes. Yeah, yeah. It, Alfonso, um, we've just uh, uh, had the deadline pass for instrument uh, proposals to Mars 2020. Are there any uh, instruments that you're really excited about that you wanted to say anything about uh, for Mars 2020, or uh, uh, or you'll pass on the. <laughs> The slow ball, I'm just hitting you up here. No, well, I mean, I have a favorite, of course, <laughs> which is the one I'm involved in. Right. Uh, the one I'm involved in. The, uh, so there is, there is a number of interesting aspects to Mars 2020. Mars 2020 is down the MSL path. It's like, it's a, if, if anything, it's, it's, a, it's downgraded copies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely not MSL in storage. It's the opposite. Uh, and they it's MSL without the steroids. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. Once, once removed, yeah. Right. Um, and, and they made it very clear, at least in, in, the, in previous reports before the announcement of the opportunity, uh, they made it very clear the type of instruments they wanted. They didn't want to invest a lot of instruments that do chemistry in the place. They want to invest uh, on instruments that can give you an idea of what the samples you're collecting, and then the idea is to bring the samples back to Earth. That's the first step towards Mars sample return. Now, my problem is not with the instruments. I wish I could have those instruments and send them somewhere else. And the problem is, my personal problem is with, with the kind of places that they might be sending the instruments to, which is ancient habitable environments like Gale Crater, places where I don't think we'll have any chance of finding any biochemistry because whatever was living there, it's long gone, and we only see fossils. And if we bring those samples back to Earth, I'm afraid that if, at the best case scenario, that's what we find, which would be great. I mean, I didn't say that. Somebody else wiser than me said, I wish I could have a stromalite from Mars sitting on my shelf. But that's not going to change my fundamental perspective of the origins of life and the fundamental properties of life. It's going to tell me that there, is, there, is life on, there was life on Mars, but it's going to tell me whether it was a first or a second genesis, for example. And that, I'm afraid, that's in the best case scenario what we can learn from either going to those places in situ or bringing samples from those places back. So to answer your question, the instrument that we were proposing is an instrument, it's actually made in Spain, which is my home country, by the way. So I have two reasons to support that instrument. <laughs> and, uh, and that's an instrument that uh, it's called SOLID. It searches, it uses antibodies to search for evidence of life. It's like, it uses the same thing as our immune system uses. So it, it targets specific compounds that are complex biochemical compounds in three dimensional structures. It can also target specific amino acids, but the essence of the instrument is this targets, it, it looks for biochemistry and biochemistry only. And so uh, it's a long shot, and I don't think it's going to be selected. But, you know, that's how it is. Right. Well, we have a, um, a oh. special SETI.org slash talks mount for you. Um, it's definitely worth it. <laughs>
yeah, maybe you can fill it with um, some of those bacteria from Chile or anything <laughs> like that. And uh, Maybe they grow in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See how it goes. Thank you very much. But please join me in thanking Alfonso. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any more questions, please come up and chat to Alfonso.